This news is funded by viewers like you. Please support our work at democracynow.org slash give. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez in Chicago. Hi, Juan. Uh, happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, Amy. Uh, and, uh, and a welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. As the death toll from Israel's bombardment of Gaza since the October 7th Hamas attack on Israel now exceeds 22,000, South Africa has filed a case at the International Court of Justice in The Hague, accusing Israel of genocide and trying to, quote, destroy Palestinians in Gaza. This comes as the separate International Criminal Court is already investigating alleged war crimes committed by both Israel and Hamas. In its filing to the ICJ, the main judicial body for the United Nations, South Africa says, quote, the acts and omissions by Israel complained of by South Africa are genocidal in character because they're intended to bring about the destruction of a substantial part of the Palestinian national, racial and ethnical group, unquote. South Africa accused Israel of violating the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, which Israel, Israel has signed on to. Israel responded by calling the charge, quote, without legal merit. The Israeli foreign ministry accused South Africa of, quote, collaborating with a terrorist group that calls for Israel's annihilation, unquote. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa has compared Israel's treatment of Palestinians in the occupied territories to the racist system of apartheid in his own country, which ended in 1994 after nearly half a century. In November, Ramaphosa responded to Israel's assault on Gaza by recalling South Africa's diplomats from Israel. The collective punishment of Palestinian civilians through the unlawful use of force by Israel is a war crime. The deliberate denial of medicine, fuel, food and water to the residents of Gaza is tantamount to genocide. Meanwhile, in October, South African lawmaker and the grandson of Nelson Mandela and Kosi Mandela joined a Palestinian solidarity protest in Cape Town. Palestinians are counting on each and every one of us to stand and be counted like they stood side by side with us in the trenches when we fought to liberate our country. For more, we're joined by Francis Boyle. Professor of International Law at the University of Illinois College of Law, he previously applied the Genocide Convention for Bosnia and won two requests for provisional protection from the ICJ against Yugoslavia, and thinks the same could apply here. His books include The Bosnian People Charge Genocide, as well as Palestine, Palestinians and International Law, and World Politics, Human Rights and International Law. Professor Boyle, welcome back to Democracy Now! It's good to have you with us in this new year, but under very serious circumstances. If you can explain why it's South Africa that's bringing this charge, and what exactly is the International uh, Court of Justice, where it fits into the world justice system, and talk about the charge of genocide. Well. Thank you very much for having me on, Amy, my best to your listening uh, audience. Uh, not to toot my own horn here, but uh, I was the first lawyer ever to win anything under the Genocide Convention from the International Court of Justice uh, that goes back to uh, 1921. I single-handedly won two world court orders for the Republic of Bosnia-Herzegovina against Yugoslavia. Uh, to cease and desist from committing all acts of genocide. And based on my careful review of all the documents so far submitted by the Republic of South Africa, uh, I believe South Africa will win an order against Israel to cease and desist from committing all acts of genocide uh, against the Palestinians. And then we will have an official determination 
by the International Court of Justice itself, the highest uh, legal authority in the United Nations system, that genocide is going on. And under Article I of the Genocide Convention, all contracting parties, 153 states, will then be obliged, quote, to prevent, unquote, the genocide by Israel against the Palestinians. Second, when the World Court gives this cease and desist order against Israel, the Biden administration will stand condemned under Article 3, Paragraph E of the Genocide Convention that criminalizes complicity in genocide. And clearly, we know that the Biden administration has been aiding and abetting Israeli genocide against the Palestinians here for quite some time. Uh, this uh, uh, has also been raised by my friends in the Center for Constitutional Rights uh, and in uh, the National Lawyers Guild in a lawsuit uh, against Biden, Blinken, and, uh, and Austin. So I believe uh, we will be able to use uh, the, the world court order. Uh, the, right now, my sources tell me the hearing will be January 11, January 12. Based on my experience with the Bosnians, uh, we can expect an order uh, within a week. I would also say, with respect to the Biden administration, uh, they are currently in violation of the Genocide Convention Implementation Act that makes genocide a crime uh, under United States law. And again, once we uh, South Africa wins this uh, order, uh, the Biden administration also uh, will stand in violation of the Genocide Convention Implementation Act. So I believe this is where uh, we will be going uh, between now, I would say, and, and the end of this month. And it is up to all of us as American citizens to figure out and support uh, uh, what South Africa is doing at the International Court of Justice here. And Francis Boyle, uh, what's the difference between the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court, which is already considering allegations of war crimes by both Israel as well as the Palestinian militant groups? Right, Juan. The International Court of Justice was originally established back in uh, 1921, its predecessor, legal predecessor in law. Uh, and that is where I filed the. Uh, genocide case. I was the first lawyer ever uh, to win two orders in one such case since the World Court was founded in uh, 1921, and it was on the basis of the Genocide Convention. The International uh, Criminal Court is a separate uh, uh, international organization uh, set up in uh, 2000. The problem, one is this. Back in 2009, after Operation Cast Lead, I advised Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas to accept the jurisdiction of the International Court, of the International Criminal Court for Palestine, which he did. I regret to report that the International Criminal Court has not done one darn thing to help the Palestinians since 2009. The International Criminal Court has all the blood of the Palestinian people on its hands since 2009. And Juan, that is why uh, uh, we set up a campaign uh, to, fi to find a state willing to file a lawsuit at the International Court of Justice, uh, the World Court. Uh, the ICC basically uh, operates at the behest of its funders and founders and masters, which is the U.S., the NATO states, the European states, uh, et cetera, until their uh, expedited uh, indictment of uh, President Putin as uh, U.S. NATO lawfare against Russia. The International Criminal Court had not indicted 
one American, one European, one Brit, one NATO uh, citizen, and one Israeli, uh, and one white person. So uh, we've gone, we have a campaign now uh, to support the Republic of South Africa at the International Court of Justice. Uh, and we are asking, we're starting this campaign today. I'm part of a, a coalition. Uh, we're starting this campaign to get, today to get members of the Genocide Convention to file declarations of intervention at the World Court in support and solidarity uh, with, with South Africa uh, against Israel and in support of the uh, Palestinians. That uh, but, material uh, but, uh, hopefully Fran will go out today. Francis, I wanted to ask you, though, Joan Donahue is the president of the International Court of Justice. She previously worked in the U.S. State Department. How do you think she will approach South Africa's application? What, what power does she have to shape the proceedings? That's a good question, uh, Juan. Yes. Donahue is a lifelong, career-long U.S. State Department legal apparatchik, which is how she got the job. And uh, I'm sure she's in contact right now today with the U.S. State Department, giving them uh, a heads up on everything going on over there at The Hague behind the scenes. Uh, she will tow the State Department party line uh, in these proceedings. I regret to report the president does have a lot of power there uh, uh, to shape these uh, proceedings. I suspect she will use that power uh, to shape the proceedings in, in favor uh, of Israel. However, I have also been advised that the uh, Republic of South Africa is, as of now, nominating a judge ad hoc uh, that is their right under the uh, statute of the International Court of Justice. I, I don't have a name yet, but I would hope the uh, South African judge ad hoc uh, will do his or her best to, to try to, to keep uh, Donahue uh, straight. I want to go back to South Africa, um, who has done this genocide filing. In 2008, I had the opportunity to speak with the South African anti-apartheid icon, the Nobel Peace Laureate, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. I caught up with him at the South African Vice Consul's apartment in New York, right before Archbishop Tutu received the Global Citizens Circle Award. I asked him about Palestine. Would you compare the occupation of Gaza and Palestine, of Gaza and the West Bank to apartheid South Africa? I, I have to speak about what I know. I mean, uh, most people, a Jew, will usually speak about their experiences and maybe compare whatever it is that is happening with what happened um, uh, in the days of the Holocaust. For, for me, coming from South Africa and going, I mean, and looking at the, at the checkpoints and, and the arrogance of those young soldiers, probably scared. <laughs> Maybe covering up the uh, the apprehension that there was there's no no way in which I couldn't say. Of course, that is that is the truth. It reminds me, it reminds me of the kind of experiences uh, uh, that we underwent. So that was Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Uh, Francis Boyle, talk about the significance of it being South Africa and what it means for one state to bring a charge against another state, um, who are signatories here, and um, how binding is this? Uh, explain what happened, for example, in Bosnia. Sure. Uh, well, first, the uh, connection there with uh, the late uh, great uh, Archbishop uh, Tutu. The current lead counsel now in the lawsuit for South Africa is Professor John Dugard, uh, a longtime friend of mine. Uh, Professor Dugard 
was one of the uh, very few courageous white professors of international law who internationally opposed the criminal apartheid system in South Africa at risk to his life. Second, later on, uh, Professor Dugard uh, became UN Special Rapporteur for uh, Palestine. I read uh, all of his reports. Uh, they are uh, excellent. Uh, Professor Dugard's heart and head uh, are in the right place with the Palestinians, and he is one of the top professors of international law uh, in the world. So there is a direct comparison between uh, the Israeli apartheid system on all the Palestinians, including Palestinian citizens uh, of Israel, and what happened in uh, apartheid uh, South Africa. Indeed, Professor Dugard has written that the uh, Israeli system of apartheid uh, against the Palestinians is worse uh, than the uh, apartheid that the Afrikaners applied to the uh, black people in South Africa. I was involved in the uh, struggle against uh, apartheid uh, in South Africa, and that is my assessment, uh, too. Indeed, uh, the parallels here then led me in November 2000 to call for the uh, establishment in a speech, the establishment of the divestment disinvestment campaign uh, against Israel for the exact same reasons we had a divestment disinvestment campaign against the criminal apartheid regime in South Africa. And then in 2005, Palestinian civil society contacted me to go in with them on establishing the Palestinian boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaign against Israel, against apartheid Israel, for the exact same reason we had a BDS campaign uh, against the criminal apartheid regime in South Africa. So uh, Tutu, uh, Dugard, I, and uh, I would uh, Ramaphosa, uh, the foreign minister uh, in South Africa, uh, who's made very uh, compelling speeches. They all understand what's going on here and what's at stake. The issue of genocide in Bosnia, if you could explain for people who are not familiar um, with what happened, and then what came of um, the charges at the International um, Court of Justice. Yes, well, uh, Yugoslavia exterminated about uh, 200,000 uh, Bosnians, uh, raped about uh, 40,000 uh, Bosnian women. I was the lawyer for all of them, arguing their case at the International Court of uh, Justice, and I won these uh, uh, two orders on 8 April 1993 and 13 September uh, 1993. Until I won that uh, uh, order, 8 April 1993, uh, everyone was denying that genocide was going on. Uh, and once I won that order that was massive and overwhelming in favor of the Bosnians, uh, no one could deny any more that genocide was going on. Uh, as for the uh, effectiveness, uh, when I walked out of the World Court on April 1993 uh, and won that order, I walked into the uh, foyer there uh, outside the grand courtroom, the whole world news media were there, and I said at the time, uh, the World Court has just determined that genocide is going on in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Under Article 1, uh, every state party to the Genocide Convention has an obligation to prevent genocide in Bosnia, and I hereby uh, request direct military intervention by the United States and the NATO states to save the Bosnians from genocide. Later that day, the United States and NATO announced that they were instituting a no-fly zone, uh, uh, enforcing a no-fly zone uh, over Bosnia. So uh, these orders by the World Court can have consequences. And it will be up to us here in the United States 
to, to devise the strategy for uh, consequences for the Biden administration, because we have to pressure the Biden administration to order Israel to stop the genocide. They will do what we Americans tell them to do. In Operation Cast Lead, uh, that had been going on for a period of time uh, under President Bush Jr., uh, Obama, the uh, Obama people were coming into power. Obama uh, was about to be inaugurated. And in order not to spoil Obama's uh, inauguration, the United States government told Israel to stop Operation Cast Lead. So we have to understand we here in the United States of America have the power to stop this. But we have to figure out how to use the order that South Africa will win here in the United States of America. This is exactly what happened in uh, Nicaragua. You remember, uh, Amy, uh, I was involved in advising almost every peace NGO and a uh, lawyer here in the United States on the uh, legal issues with respect to Reagan's war against Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala. My teacher, mentor, and friend, the late great Abe Chase at Harvard Law School, won a world court order against the Reagan administration in 1984, and then also a final judgment on the merits in 1986. We here in the United States use that world court order and the final judgment to stop Reagan's war against Nicaragua. Regretfully, uh, we have 20 16, seconds. 000, regretfully, 16,000 Nicaraguans were killed, including U.S. citizen uh, Ben Linder. But we did stop that. And I believe that with this world court order that South Africa uh, will win, we can stop what Israel is doing to the Palestinians. Francis Boyle, professor of international law at the University of Illinois College of Law. His books include The Bosnian People Charged Genocide, Palestine, Palestinians and International Law, as well as World Politics, Human Rights and International Law. Democracy Now! is funded by viewers like you. Please give today at democracynow.org give.